So Christopher, thank you very much for being with us today and uh, in the morning for you. So first, can you introduce yourself about your experience and practice in Aikido or other martial arts? Oh, okay. Um, thank you for having me uh, this evening, this morning. Uh, my name is Chris Lee. I'm from Honolulu, Hawaii right now. I started Aikido in 1981 on the mainland with uh, Mitsuki Saltome's group. And then uh, after that, we'll do the condensed version. But uh, after that, I uh, moved to Japan after college for about 15 years. Uh, I practiced uh, mainly Aikikai Aikido, but also I went to see uh, a lot of different places, uh, Yoshinkan, Iwama, mm -hmm. uh, Daitoryu, some Koryu Japanese arts. Uh, there's a lot to see in the Tokyo area. And then uh, eventually we moved back to Hawaii uh, and I started continued training in Hawaii. Uh, eventually around 2010, I also started training with uh, Dan Harden. And uh, I don't know if you've heard of him or yeah. of, uh, what he yeah. does, but uh, then in around uh, 2011, we, uh, a group of us split off into our own group also, an Aikikai affiliated group, but mainly focusing uh, around Dan Harden's training. And uh, that brings us today where we're not doing anything at all because we're all locked down. So yeah. we're in the middle of that last year. Okay. So your first teacher was Mitsugi Sotome? That's right. Well, actually, a oh. student of Mitsugi Saltom is Frank Rea, who is one of his okay. uh, senior students, one of the three people who, or three or four people who started Aikido Schools of Ueshiba, Mitsugi Saltome's organization, when he first moved to the United States. Uh, but my first promotions, they're all through Mitsugi Saltome. The, the school was very small then, ASU, but much smaller than it is yeah. today. So it's basically, you know, Saltome Sensei and, and his students. Yeah, yeah, I asked the question because it's uh, uh, not all the day we can talk with uh, students of uh, Saotome Sensei because mm -hmm. it, 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 I, I, don't, uh, I don't know, I don't feel his organization is really big. And uh, so uh, I, I watch videos by his past, or, uh, but never talk with a, a direct student. So interesting for me. He, he's he's a character. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he, he's very he, he, he's very skilled. He's very good. Uh, I, I thought he was a, a difficult instructor to follow um, because yeah, of yeah, his teaching he, style. He, he, he looks he looks like uh, <clears throat> straight. <down. laughs> he's he's straight in, uh, but he's also you know he'd go up and he'd do ten different things, and you had to figure out which one which one of them we were supposed to do. So is uh, you know he he was uh, originally a student of Seiko Yamaguchi who was also uh, a very difficult instructor to follow because yeah. his style was so uh, I want to say artistic or flowing. Right. So if you look at uh, Morihiro Saito or Gozo Shioda, uh, Shoji Nishio, even uh, people like that, they're very organized, right? They're very yeah. set. They had a, a methodology and a curriculum. Uh, no, that's no, they're better. No, they're better or worse. Everybody has different styles. But um, the uh, Mitsuki Saltome, Seiko Yamaguchi, those people were very, uh, it, it was very artistic. So it was more and more difficult yeah. to figure out what was supposed to be going on. And and so to to uh, not, not to conclude, but to finish your introduction, mm -hmm. uh, I mm -hmm. see you you have a blog and you write article about Daitoryu, about Aikido, about a lot of things right. you you think and you. C can you explain a little bit? Uh, that's my own rantings and ravings right on my blog. So uh, there have been uh, internet discussions on uh, Aikido for a long time. Right? Uh, I started talking back on the old Aikido L mailing list. I don't know if anybody still remembers that back when people still had listservs and communicated by email. Uh, and there were all of these discussions about Aikido. and uh, Eventually, I started writing some of these things down uh, because it was easier than explaining them every time. And because it, as a, as a hobby to help me organize my thoughts. Uh, at that time, I was reading, studying more Japanese. So uh, I thought it would be helpful to people also if I could 
explain some of the things I was seeing in Japanese to people who perhaps did not speak Japanese. So I've included a lot of translations of various interviews uh, with instructors and so forth, and just uh, products of my uh, hobby. I mean, I know that some people have referred to me as a historian, um, but I'm not, you know, I'm not really a historian, I'm a hobbyist. You know, there, strictly speaking, there are no historians in Aikido, right? Uh, even Stan Cronin was self-trained, right? He was a hobbyist, he wasn't a professional historian. Uh, the closest we get is maybe Peter Goldsbury, right? He's uh, actually a real academic, and, and if you've read his articles, um, they're very good. They're very complex, right? And they're, they're very deep. Uh, but outside, even, even that, he's not, that's not his job, right? That's just uh, a side hobby. He wrote some articles about Aikido. There's really, there are really no professional historians in Aikido. So, um, but the, the virtue of the internet is that everybody can share this information. I, when, when I started, we didn't know anything. We knew nothing about nothing. Right? Uh, there was a few things that looked like they were hand copied. They were issued by Stan Cronin. There were a couple of books that weren't very good, you know, like Aikido in the Dynamic Sphere. Mm -hmm. uh, John Stevens started coming out with books later on. And uh, really, people didn't have much information. Right? So one of the virtues that we have today is that people can share this information. And everybody knows, compared to what I knew when I started, just that their level of knowledge is much, much higher, 10 times, 100 times higher. And it's it's interesting because uh, I, I follow you on internet. I, I read uh, uh, your blog uh, and old mm -hmm. article, and uh, you you are active on Facebook, by example. And mm -hmm. it's interesting because uh, for, for you, quality is important, and it's not just saying something. Because today, a lot of people can say on internet uh, something mm -hmm. about Aikido or martial art. But in your blog, you have in different articles, Japanese version, English version, and the translation. And um, ca can you explain for you uh, what is important today to preserve maybe in Aikido or to keep alive and uh, against what you, you, not to fight, but uh, what you don't agree with, with internet. Well, Internet is difficult, right? <laughs> there yes, are a lot of good yes. things and there are a lot of bad things, right? Yes. Uh, the, the good thing is that information is free, right? Mm -hmm. So we can talk to each other. When, when I started, it was almost 40 years ago, right? I didn't talk to anybody in France. Right? I didn't talk to anybody around the world about Aikido. We were in a bubble. Um, of course, people, I think people should be able, should practice the way they want to practice. You know, people are free to do whatever they want for whatever reason. I think that's great, right? People enjoy different things. Uh, some people enjoy pottery. I don't enjoy pottery. Some people enjoy dance. I don't enjoy dance. That's fine. Uh, but when you're talking about things, you, know, you talk about the history. Somebody did this. Somebody said this. Uh, we do this because this person did that. Then I think it's important to be accurate. Right. Otherwise, you're just you're just making you're just making up things to, and, and as happened on, on the internet, you're making up things usually to justify your own opinion. Right. So there, there's the history. If we, if we separate it, right, there's the history of what happened. Right. This person did this. This person lived here. This person went there. Then there are the reasons why they happened, which are fine. Right. So this person went here for this reason. Uh, but then what happens is that, uh, I'm sorry, my computer is uh, not now, okay. <laughs> then the, what happens is that that becomes combined with people's um, desire for authenticity and justification, right? So if you are a boxer, right, no boxer ever stands up before a boxing match and says, I lived with Coach Bob for 15 years, and he taught me the secret boxing techniques. And I, I teach, I, I fight with the boxing techniques of Coach Bob, right? A boxer steps into the ring, and then the proof of what they're doing, and they show you what they're doing, right? When they win or lose, however the, the, the match comes out. 
but in traditional martial arts, or all traditional martial arts, I think, Aikido, Karate, uh, any non-competitive traditional martial art, um, there's really no venue for that, right? You know, if you're, maybe, maybe you go out and get into fights, but nobody sees that. Uh, there's no competitive venue that's objective. And so people tend to try to justify their art or uh, prove the authenticity of it. Uh, and then it becomes sort of poisonous, right? Because they say, well, everybody loves their teacher, of course, right? They're, they're training with their teacher because they like their teacher. Oh, you know, you wouldn't be there if you didn't like your teacher. So yeah. everybody has a reason why their teacher is better than other teachers, right? My teacher is the best because he was the oldest student of O Sensei, or he was the last student of O Sensei. I know four or five people who claim to be the last Uchideshi uh, of Murihei <laughs> yes. Ueshiba, right? Yes. I, 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 and I'm not sure what that means. You know, they were the last one in the room. Last one in the room, please turn off the lights. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, they, they were uh, had some special relationship. They were, you know, in the same religion or, uh, you know, it happens with all martial arts, right? Yeah, so if you go back to Chinese martial arts, it's the same thing. They say, oh, I always had a special relationship with this teacher and so forth. And that's, of course, it's unprovable whether you're better because of that, right? And then what happens is that the students pick that up and the students say, well, because my teacher was the best, that means that I am the best and that we are what we are doing is the best. So I don't know if, you, if this happens in France, but in, in America, they have a, you know, they say, my dad is bigger than your, your dad. They say, my, little, little kids argue, children argue, they say, my father is bigger than your father, yes. right? Because my father is bigger than your father, or my father can beat up your father, that means I'm better than you, right? Yeah. So it, it doesn't really make sense, and it becomes very poisonous on the internet, right? Because you get people who are religiously attached to their methodology or to their teachers. So you get people who, uh, you know, they say, well, my teacher did this and that's the correct way. Your way is wrong, right? My way is better than your way and then they get into fights on the internet. And if we're talking about a technical discussion in a certain situation, right, you can say, okay, this, te this technical approach is better for this situation because of this, because X, Y, Z, right? That's very objective. But what happens is people say, well, this, this is better because my teacher said so, right? And then, well, that doesn't make sense, right? So, and, <sighs> and, and so you in Aikido, what are you looking for? So what's your kind of maybe uh, today after 40 years of practice, what are you looking <laughs> for Aikido? Because it changed with time, so. It does change with time and I've, I've enjoyed every style of Aikido I've ever trained in, right? I, I, I trained in Iwama, I saw Morihiro Saito Sensei, right? I've trained in Yoshinkan. I, I never never got to touch Kozo Shioda, but I, I enjoyed training in Yoshinkan. I enjoyed Daitoryu, Key Society, whatever it is. I've always enjoyed it. I mean, there, there are people that you have personality clashes with, but uh, basically speaking, every, every style of Aikido, even every martial art I've trained in, you know, Karate or Tai Chi or Taekwondo, uh, I've always enjoyed the training. Um, but I guess your interests change over the years. Uh, so uh, now, um, I, as, I, as I mentioned before, the, the focus of my interest is kind of a subset of what um, Morihei Oishiba was doing, and that's the internal power training part. Uh, Alessander, if you know, he wrote a book about uh, internal power training in Daitoryu and, uh, and Aikido. And then that's really what I'm focused on right now. Uh, not, and I'm not saying it's better than any other kind of training in Aikido, but it's what interests me. Uh, I find it fascinating um, and I find it interesting and that, that's why I do it. Uh, it's, also, uh, it's also maybe perhaps good for older people. You know, I'm not old but uh, I'm not young anymore. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I don't train quite the same way as I did when I was younger. Yeah, I, I read you, you wrote some article about uh, internal power, I thought. Mm. Um, and uh, can, can you explain or uh, maybe 
uh, give some uh, example of uh, of what you you're talking about for people who are who heard you mm -hmm. so uh internal power is power it's all power right so um it's not different than any other kind of power basically speaking so uh, it's uh people hear internal power and they say oh you're all about key and rainbows shooting from your fingertips, right? Uh, but um, classically, if we're talking about, uh, say, Chinese arts, right, they would divide, um, divide arts into internal arts and external arts. But that's really an artificial division. It's for convenience. What, what, it, what it is is that you're, they're dividing different, what are basically different training methodologies uh, into different categories and separating them into external and internal. Uh, so for what I'm talking about, when I talk about internal martial arts and an external martial arts, an external martial art would be concerned with uh, speed, leverage, positioning. So the things that are related to uh, myself and the opponent. So there's a relationship between myself and the opponent, right? My angle in relation to the opponent uh, leverage with relation to the opponent, and so forth. Uh, when I'm talking about internal power, I'm talking about uh, my relationship to myself. In other words, how I'm using my body, uh, how I'm uh, handling incoming force with my body, how I'm managing outgoing force with my body, uh, and how I'm directing that. We talk a lot about intent, uh, about the, the use of the mind and intent, and of course, all movement is directed by the mind, right? External, the internal movement. Um, the reason why we talk about an internal movement, or one of the reasons, is that a lot of the uh, body usage for internal martial arts is extremely counterintuitive, right? It's very difficult. It's not, not, it's not difficult because, um, it's not difficult because it's difficult, if you understand that. It's difficult because it's something that we don't normally do. Yeah. Right. So, so, so any normal skill, any normal skill that's different from the way you've been using your body for 40 years or 50 years, it's going to be difficult to pick up a new way to move. Right. So if I walk into a ballet class, it'll be very difficult. Right. So um, in internal martial arts, the, the body usage is quite different. Uh, so it requires a lot of focused concentration. That's why we, that's, that's why we talk about intent. But in the end, of course, it's all physics, right? It has to be, right? There's not, no magic. It's all physics and biomechanics and uh, how it's implemented, right? There's no, no magic, no key, except that key is part of a model to get your body to work the way you want it to do, right? So, you know, in the old days, uh, the good old days, right? When you were training with a master one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you, you, you'd kind of, you'd pick up these things often just by training training directly with, with the teacher. You picked them up almost instinctively. Uh, that was Morihiro Saito's great advantage, right? Because he was alone in Iwama with O-sensei. And, you know, they'd farm a little and then they'd train a little. And, and he got to be one-on-one -on -one in a situation that many people weren't, right? So you can pick that up, right? But, uh, of course, today that's not, not so possible, right? You can't live with your teacher for 10 years or 20 years. And you can't train them with every, every day if you have a, a job and a family and so forth. And so we have to uh, kind of rationalize things a little, a little more than they used to be. Yeah. And, and, and do, you, do, do you use or develop some uh, solo practice for uh, this internal power? Or maybe, maybe during your period of lockdown, do you think about solo practice to continue to work on your internal power? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, primarily solo practice. Uh, so, um, as I said, it's about how you manage your body. Right? Mm -hmm. So, in, in a way, the training method is primarily solo. And then when you get to paired practice, what you're doing is you're testing your solo practice. So, you, you, you basically you, you, you do your solo training, and you get into paired practice, and you take it out for a spin and see how it works. Oh, not so good. So go back, train some more, <laughs> take it out for a spin. Oh, not, not so good, but maybe a little better. So go back, train some more. 
go out and take it for a spin and, and take it out. And um, if you look at people like uh, Yukio Shisagawa, the Daichuryu instructor, mm -hmm. right, he, he was also primarily focused on solo trading. It's the same thing he uses his ukes to kind of play with, to test himself out. Uh, Hiroshi Tada, right, the, uh, the ninth dan, he, he would say that um, maybe four or five, you, you should train, so, train solo four or five times the amount that you train with a partner, right? Okay. So there should be a large portion of solo, to, even in boxing, if you're looking at boxing, right? Uh, the actual amount of time you spend in sparring in boxing, it's very small, yeah. right? 80%, 90% of the time in boxing is conditioning, right? You're running, you're working the heavy bag, right? You're, you're, you're training up and then you, then you get in and you spar and you try to get your body that you've conditioned to do the things that you want it to do. Uh, Morihiro Saito uh, used to um, said once something that was very perceptive, I thought. Uh, yeah, you know, I guess in, in Iwama, they are very rare. They very rarely did warm up exercises, right? You go and you you, you do fight would go and you go do do ikkyo, you do tai no henko, right? So someone asked him one day, you know, sensei, how come we don't do uh, warm up exercises? We're not you know stretching or whatever, and uh, before we do aikido. Uh, so Saito sensei said, well, these are ikkyo nikkyo sankyo. These are the warm up exercises for doing aikido. Right, this is an Aikido. Yeah. This is training for doing Aikido, right? So yeah, in, in, in a way, I, that... I think it's he it, 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 it said exactly it's gymnastic of Aikido or thing something mm -hmm. like this. So. Right. right, right. So ideally, if you're doing partner training, even traditionally, you're trying to the the kata the the, the the partner training is supposed to condition your body, right, and 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 train it to move in a certain way to be used in a certain way. And that, that's good, I think, it, as far as it goes. The, the tricky part with um, partner practice is often that you get um, trapped into the kata, if you, if, if you understand what I'm saying. So people, mm -hmm. the, the point of the partner practice becomes the partner practice, right? To make the partner practice better, rather than the partner practice training your body and training you to use your body in a certain way. Yes, I, uh, two, two things I will, uh, you, you said two interesting uh, things. You, you talk about testing your solo practice with partner. And it's really interesting mm -hmm. because a lot of people think Aikido is easy. It's, you, you just have to follow the flow. <laughs> and, <laughs> but uh, uh, we, we can find a lot of Aikido description of you use the opponent uh, flow. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's so easy in in the world. And uh, testing your solo practice with partner is interesting because Uke is not someone who did uh, or do the technique, and you mm -hmm. have to to build it. Oh, okay, yeah. And so one thing they say in Tai to do is they say is that when you do the uh, Uke moves, you don't move. Right. Uh, that doesn't mean you shouldn't move, ne never. But often you see uh, in, in uh, a lot of times in modern Aikido, you see the uh, uke moving very little and, the, and the, the, uh, the nage moving around in big movements, uh, big flowing movements, while the, uh, while the uh, then eventually the uke takes a fall. Right. So, and it is very easy, right? Because it's all a set pattern. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, uh, the, the goal is to make the pattern successful in, in Aikido. Um, uh, one of the things they used to say in Sagawa Dojo, the, the Dojo Daito Yoshi, uh, the Daito Ryu Dojo, mm -hmm. uh, the one of the things they used to emphasize that it's okay if, uh, when you practiced, if things didn't work, right? And I think that's very difficult to accept for many Aikido people, because when it doesn't work, it means you did something wrong. But actually, when it doesn't work, it mean, just means it didn't work. It means you have to fix something. But in Aikido, when it doesn't work, often people look for other reasons. They say, oh, you didn't take correct ukemi. Right? That, that's why I couldn't throw you. And I've had high-ranking instructors you know, correct, correct my ukemi right? because throws didn't turn out the, the way they wanted the throws to, fall, to turn out. 
Well, and that's kind of a poisonous thought because then you are you you, you relinquish responsibility for doing the technique. I um, I I think in one of my interviews with uh, Morihiro Saito Sensei, the one the one I translated from Morihiro Saito Sensei, I, I started it with a story of someone who trained in Iwama and I guess uh, fell down without being thrown down. And Saito Sensei came over and he gave him a scolding, right? Uh, you know that uh, Aikido is supposed to work, you know, whether the uke, you know, wants to fall or not. So what are you, what are you doing, just taking a fall? And um, it makes, of course, the, the, the technique more successful, uh, but it's in the end bad for the nugget in a way, right? Because then the, the nugget thinks that they're able to do this beautiful throw, but perhaps they're not really able to do it. Uh, and the tricky part about the, the uke nage model is that it is artificial, right? It's completely artificial. So you have to, it has to be, um, I think, very, it requires an educated uke, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in many traditional arts, the uke is the teacher rather yeah. than the student, right? The yes. uke falls because the uke is setting up the situation for the nake. So the teacher uh, knows not to fall too soon. He knows uh, not, to, not to fall too late, right? Not to struggle against the, the nake and just make a, a meaningless practice, right? Because you're just fighting, fighting against each other. You're not learning anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess traditionally in Japan, you know, they don't they don't speak very much in training. You just follow along with whatever the teacher is doing, uh, but that often doesn't work in the West, especially because people don't train with the same people day out, day in and day out uh, for thirty years or twenty years, right? So it requires, I think, a high level of communication between the uke and the nage. Uh, well. What are you doing? Oh, you're giving you're you're attacking me too hard. Could you ease off a little bit and let me do this? Or could you give me a little more force? You're you're falling too easily, right? And this doesn't normally happen in a lot of modern Aikido dojos, right? They just try to get the end result, that the pretty picture. They're chasing the effect. Yeah. Yes. And you 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 said something interesting. Uh, Saito Sensei explained okay uh, should be strong but not as strong as um, uh, uh, ke keeping Tori blocked. Uh, to right. Tori yeah. has to do yeah. the technique under a strong uh, grab, but th right. this is something he was categoric. And uh, the, the third thing you, you, you said interesting is you need to have a body ready for the practice. You need to yes. Uh, have a stronger body and uh, wrist. And I read a book about Sagawa Sensei from Daitoryu. And mm -hmm. he explained he, he did a lot of tonren even when he was old. And yeah. in order to, for his joint, for his wrist, for his forearm, for his shoulder. So, uh, how do you practice your body or how do you incorporate your, this in your practice? Well, we have a set of solo training exercises that, that we use to condition our bodies in specific ways. So Sagawa, for example, was crazy about yes. conditioning. Yeah, um, he, he was kind of, um, if you know, uh, he was kind of um, obsessive compulsive. Yeah. So for, for example, uh, he, he couldn't do 900 repetitions of an exercise. He had to do a thousand. Or he, he couldn't do 75, it would have to be 100, it'd have to be a round number. Yeah. So if you see his training notes, uh, you, you'd see he'd mark off uh, 1,000, 1,000 sword cuts, 1,000 push-ups, 1,000 sit-ups, or whatever exercise he was doing. But he, he was also very wealthy. So he, had, uh, he didn't have to work, right? So he, he could train all day and, and be obsessive about it. Not a lot of people can, right? But, um, I think the um, it's it's important to condition your body. Uh, it's um, you have to be very specific about it, right? Because not all conditioning is the same, right? A, a bodybuilder doesn't condition condition themselves the same way a marathon runner does. They're completely different methods of exactly. conditioning. Exactly. Yeah. You know, so it has to be specific to what you're trying to do in, in Aikido. 
but yeah, I, I think it, it is necessary. Uh, uh, Segal, I think, would say that the kind of conditioning you do, you're doing um, and the kind of conditioning he was doing uh, was more involved with uh, tendon training, with tendon training, whole body usage, and less involved with, say, bodybuilder type yeah. training, just to, just to be rough, roughly divide them. Uh, so it was a kind of training he could continue until he was older. Um, actually, one of his students claimed that Sagawa injured his back because he did too much uh, of uh, training with the tanen, but with that heavy, heavy iron, iron staff that he used to swing uh, from his wheelchair, right? Because he was in his wheelchair and he'd still be swinging the, the, the tanen bow, and they claimed that he just it, it destroyed his back at that point because he, he couldn't hold up to it. I, I don't know whether that's true, but you can always <laughs> overdo it. Of course. I, I think it's, it, it's a story on the book of uh, Kimura Sensei, a student of Sagawa. He, he wrote mm -hmm. a, a notebook from his training under Sagawa Sensei. And yeah. he explained yeah. about his um, iron, iron sword or iron bow. And he swings 1,000 or 10,000. And yeah. he said, it's completely crazy <laughs> for the student. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so Sagawa would do a lot of heavy training. Um, of course, he was very advanced, right? But he would also do a lot of very specific training, right? So for example, he had a, he had a, a rack of hammers, right? From, from little tiny hammers uh, at one end to very big hammers at the other end. And so he'd pick up a hammer and he'd train um, using his hara, right? Trying to use his hara to move his hand and move the hammer, right? So he's... Uh, uh, using his hara, as you can imagine, and he's using it to uh, to to move move his hands. Uh, and he'd start at the lower end, and then he'd work his way up. And I think uh, one day uh, a teacher, a uh, student, asked him because he he only got about halfway up the the rack of hammers. He didn't get to the end. He said, "How come you don't use the larger hammers?" And he said, "Well, I'm not good enough for that yet." Right. So it's it's. Um, you know, he was very specific about his training. It wasn't just uh, bigger is better, yeah. right? So I, I, I think you have to you have to be careful about what you're looking for in your training. And of course, there's not, nothing wrong, you know, because most of us are not going to be Daijoryu masters or Aikido masters. You know, people want to go out and, and bodybuild because they like bodybuilding. I think that's great, you know, whether it impedes their, uh, the, the purity of their Aikido practice or not. You know, I mean, I... I've, I've always been interested in um, endurance sports, so I ran a lot. You know, um, sometimes I'd run 100 miles a week. Uh, I don't even know what that is in kilos, but it, uh, a lot of long range, long range running, and it doesn't create you know the the, the biggest body, right? When when you when you run marathons, uh, you're always skinny. Right? You know, you're never going to be heavy enough. So um, you know, if I if I'm going if I were thinking about fighting, right? If I, I, wanted, I wanted to be the deadliest fighter in the world, I wanted to be a street fighter, uh, then of course I think I'd have to put on more bulk, right? I have, have to be heavier, stronger. Uh, but that, that, you know, of course it's not what I choose for my lifestyle. Uh, so yeah, everybody has their own, you know, it's not just a matter of what you're training in for your art, or what you're training in for your, for your life. But I think in general, and I, you know, a lot of people are out of shape by any standard, right? <laughs> you know, a lot of a lot of teachers are just large, but shall we say, right? So, but uh, it's, I mean, that's okay. That's their their choice. But if you're an instructor and and you look like that, it can be problematic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 lose kind of sort of a uh, role model, we can say, and. Uh, uh, maybe because of the no competitive aspect or because mm -hmm. of the uh, philosophy of Aikido or maybe a lot of Aikidoka didn't consider their body in practice. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a problem too for when, when you go hold and it's not mm -hmm. healthy a lot or something like that. But you also the other the other side of it is that uh, in all all traditional Asian martial arts, I think generally speaking, 
if they don't separate the teacher and the coach, right? So if you look in professional sports, uh, nobody cares if the coach is out of shape. Yeah. Right. It doesn't. It, it's not relevant. You know. Uh, actually, the coach doesn't even have to be very good. Right. So uh, uh, Mike Tyson's coach. Uh, what was his name? Uh, I can't remember his name now. But Mike Tyson's coach had one professional fight that he lost. Right. So he 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 wasn't he wasn't uh, he wasn't a great boxer, but he was uh, a really superior coach. Right. Yeah. So there, there are two, two, two different sets of coaching skills in professional sports, right? So great athletes are often very, very bad coaches. And very, very good coaches are often very, very bad athletes, right? So it, you can be a good coach, a great coach, and uh, be not so good at, at whatever sport it is. Or you can be fat and out of shape, yeah. and, and it's okay, you know? But, you know, in Aikido, I guess in the martial arts in general, it, it gets confused, right? People expect the martial artist to be a great athlete and to be in great shape and to be a great coach, uh, to be everything and to be a great philosopher and so forth. But maybe it needs to be separated, separated more, right? People have different skill sets. Yeah, exactly. And different interests. That's right. That's right. And you, what, what, what about the, the philosophy uh, of Osense? Uh, do, do you are interested by or not at all? Or did, did you look for some people talking about that? Or? Well, I've read, I think, everything that's available uh, by Osense. Um, very few people are very are interested in talking about it either. I mean, people are interested in talking about it, uh, but usually they don't know what they're talking about, right? Because uh, most of the people who are interested in talking about it have never read the originals and the original Japanese, uh, even Japanese people. You know, I, I speak to Japanese people about it and they say, I don't know. Yeah, I say, well, what does this mean? Right, and they say, I don't know. <laughs> you know, you, you shouldn't read that. <laughs> um, so, so there, there are just just a few people, a handful of people, I think, that are really, have really read Marie Hiroi Shiba's study, studies writings. Um, Peter Goldsberg's one. Uh, Bill Gleason is another yeah. person who's uh, written some books. Uh, uh, in Japan, um, there are a couple of people in Japan. There, there's uh, Inui Sensei studied the... Uh, Osensei's writings uh, quite a bit, but it's it's very rare. Uh, they're, they're very difficult, right? Because he was um, a, a difficult personality, right? Yeah. Osensei. Uh, it, it requires a lot of background knowledge, I think, that people don't often don't have, right? He, he was, you know, Motokyo, but it also has a lot of um, a strong influence from esoteric Buddhism from Shingon, mm -hmm. uh, Tendai Buddhism, that comes, a lot of that comes from Sokaku Takeda. Sokaku Takeda was very involved with uh, esoteric Buddhism and it's involved with uh, classical Chinese texts. And then it's also mixed in with Kotodama, right? The, the science of sounds. Yeah. Uh, so it, it can get very, very complex. Um, the positive part is that Osensei was very repetitive, mm -hmm. right? So he, he, he was, uh, and I think a lot of great martial artists are like this. He, he was very obsessive, right? Uh, Yuki Oshisagawa, right, was very obsessive. He had to do that. Uh, Murihiro Ishiba was very much the same way, right? If you read the old stories about him, he, he used to drive his students crazy with his obsessions. Uh, so Kako Takeda was also extremely obsessive, right? Uh, Sugawa tells a story where Takeda was trying to make, um, I think, pudding, uh, but he couldn't get the recipe right. So Sugawa goes to bed and he wakes up in the morning and the kitchen is filled with pudding. And so Kako Takeda has been making all night trying to get the recipe correct because he couldn't go to sleep until he got it correct. But that's, that's why one reason why they're so good Right, because they're always training. They are very obsessive. Um, 
So O oh, Sensei, when he wrote, was extremely repetitive. He, 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 you know, of course, he wrote many very difficult things, but he also repeated the same basic principles over and over and over in his writing. So if you read them over, you know, all, everything that's available, I think you quickly see that there are uh, some themes that always come up, right? Uh, he always talks about, well, for example, the, the number one in Takamusa Aiki, which is a, a, a book uh, that is a collection of lectures from uh, Morihiro Oishiba to the Byako Shinkokai, which is compiled by Hideo Takahashi. So that's probably the most complete collection of Osensei's writings. And the, I think it's really the only collection that's not edited, right? Most of the other texts were edited by the Aikikai. Um, sometimes for good reasons, sometimes maybe for not so good reasons, right? Because they, they eliminated some of the language. Um, and then the, the English translations were further edited, so which is another part of the problem, right? Uh, like when John Stevens translated some of the texts into English, I know he eliminated yeah. quite a lot of the quite a lot of language. So uh, in Takamusa Aiki, uh, the number one phrase that appears in Takamusa Aiki and I, I didn't count, but someone else counted. The Nui Sensei in Japan counted. I didn't count. The number one phrase that comes up in, in the book is not Aiki or love, peace, harmony. It's um, Ameno Takahashi, right? Uh, the, uh, the, the floating uh, Ameno, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Ameno Ukihashi. I'm sorry, I have to switch between English and Japanese and my mind gets confused. Uh, so it's easier for me to just speak in Japanese and it's less confusing, right? This is why I was a, 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 I was a translator, but I was never an interpreter. Okay. I, I can't change my head that quickly. So the, the floating bridge of heaven, right? Which, may, which represented his basic model, his heaven, earth, man model. And uh, Ellis Amdrick talks about this at length uh, in Hidden in Plain Sight in his book, but it's a basic classical model of um, kind of everything. Right, so classical martial arts like models that uh, express everything. Right, so they, if there's a they express the technical model, they express the model for society, and a model for heaven and earth for you know the, for the nation. Uh, they, they want it to be kind of a universal, uh, like a universal field theory. Right, so this is his basic technical model: heaven, earth, man, uh, yin and yang would be maybe the second most popular phrase, right? In and yo, right? Opposing forces. So the, ba the basic themes that he repeated were, were very common, right? So it, when you read to those, you can start to pick those out. So it, it becomes easier if, if you read them to kind of figure out uh, what he was saying, but it is difficult. And that's yeah. part of the problem in modern IQ is that people tend to quote him and they really have no idea what's going on, right? <laughs> And it's it's difficult because because uh, some words you can understand with your mind, but how do you understand with the body, and how do you pra how do how to practice uh, this word in your body? Because I think Osense was not just a, a, a talking of philosophy; he, he was mm -hmm. uh, doing it in himself, and mm -hmm. this is the most difficult part, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, this, this is very classical, I think, in, in Asian martial arts, Chinese martial arts, and that they have a kind of a system of visualization and imagery, right? Oh, oh since they believe that the gods entered his body and, and made him do things, right? Kind of. I mean, it's, you know, if, if you look at American Indians, they have the same kind of shamanistic beliefs. Uh, right, they believe these things, but they also live in the modern world, right? Murihi Oishiba also lived in the modern world, but he lived in, in, in that world too. So, the, of course, imagining things, uh, visualizing things, this is a very common model in modern sports, right? So, um, Olympic athletes use visualization to help themselves do things, right? to help them get their bodies to do things. But everybody's okay with that. Uh, Morihiro Ishiba came out of a different culture, right? So for him, imagining 
uh, the, the, the gods, Izanagi and Izanami, moving through his body, helped him to do things physically. And classically, if you go back to China, they visualize dragons rising up their spine and so forth. And this would help them to do things physically. It's a proven method that worked, worked well for them. Um, it doesn't have much meaning for modern people, I think, which is why I, I, I rarely talk about it in practice. Right. I, yeah. Except in the summary for in Timbury Hero You know, if you talk about key, you know, key, uh, it, it, it held a meaning for people 200 years ago, right? And it helped them do things. But now today, it's not so useful, I think. It's just misleading. Yeah. And I, I, I tried to read the Kojiki in order to understand. <laughs> And yeah. to be to be honest, the first time I, I try, maybe I stop after the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> when it begins with all the divinity, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just okay. So for the moment, I know Enko Morotedo. Okay, perfect. And but <laughs> it, it, it's really hard to understand the world of Osensei. Mm -hmm. And yeah, even with yeah. translation, even in my language or even in English, because I didn't speak or read Japanese. So it, mm -hmm. we have to consider translation a little uh, mistake in order to simplify or think like this. But even with that, it's really hard. Yeah, it's really difficult. I mean, even, it was even difficult in Japanese. I mean, almost all of Osensei's students who sat there in front of him, listening to it in Japanese, said they had a hard time understanding it. So that's one and, of the... Hmm. So, sorry, I can't. No, no, go ahead. Oh, and, and you talk about Kototama. Did, did, did you study something about that or...? Not seriously. I mean, it was another model that Murihio Ushiba used to explain things. Uh, if you look back even into the 1920s and back into Daitoryu, uh, his explanations are very consistent. He almost always talks about the same things from the 1930s to the 1960s, uh, but he changes the phrasing, right? So I think he was trying to find a way to express what he was doing, what he learned from Sokaku Takeda in his own worldviews language, right? So in his Omoto, Kyo Shinto language, because of course, Sokako Takeda didn't use that language. Uh, if you look back uh, to, so, to Tokuminoe Takeda's notes of Sokako's teaching, uh, Sokako Takeda used a lot of um, esoteric Buddhist language, right? because Sokako Takeda was educated in uh, Shingon Mikyo, right? in esoteric Shingon Buddhism. And Osansi was also. A, educated in a Shingon temple. So he understood that. And the Shingon language appears in Osensei's writings. Uh, but um, I think he wanted to translate that, so to speak. He wanted to convert that into his Omoto language. Mm -hmm. But that was very personal, right? No, no, he understood it, but maybe nobody else understood it, or very few people. And so he, he, wasn't, he wasn't that interested in explaining it, I think. Or maybe, maybe perhaps he couldn't because his way of thinking was a little bit di different than uh, than other people. <laughs> but that, that's a, a big problem uh, for the oral transmission, yeah. I think, and the theoretical transmission from Morihiro Ishiba down to the students is that he, he they weren't able to understand him clearly, right? Yeah, and this is something I talk with a different teacher in Aikido around the world, and. Weshiba Sensei wasn't someone who wanted to uh, teach uh, his art. He just wanted to practice and go yeah. further and deeper and continue. And students just uh, steal or keep or uh, try to learn something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was, and, he was very inspiring, yeah. right? He was very charismatic. And people would follow him, but he, I think he was basically not very much interested in teaching other people. He did, of course, but he's mainly interested in his own training. So it would be, you know, keep up if you can, otherwise too bad. 
so uh, it's it's now one hour. So uh, I I know you have a lot of things to do today because it's uh, the mm -hmm. beginning of the day. So. <laughs>